This is going nowhere. My name is Jay. Let's talk about plot. So plot is basically the sequence of events that happen in a story by principle of cause and effect. They make one thing happen and then cause the next thing to happen. If I'm drinking my tea and it's super hot and I spill it on my foot, I'll get burnt and I'll need to go to the hospital. That's a cause and effect. One thing affects the next thing. Here's an example. Number one, the prince decides to search for Cinderella with the glass shoe. Number two, Cinderella's sisters try to put on the shoe, but it doesn't fit. Step three, the shoe fits Cinderella's foot, so the prince finds her. Plot is the way that we structure our story, basically. Um, it's the sequence of events that cause everything to happen. Characters need to exist within a plot in order to go through some kind of structure, and in order to learn a lesson. There are many, many different ways to talk about plot, um, but today we're going to be talking about one specific version called the five-act structure. The five-act structure is represented by this graphic, um, often called Freitag's Pyramid, um, which is not perfect by any means. Um, but is really useful in talking about how plays and stories are usually put together. Freitag's Pyramid was made by this guy called Gustav Freitag, who has a great mustache. Um, and that's all I know about him. <laughs> part one of the pyramid is exposition or introduction. This is basically the part when we're introduced to characters and we understand how they interact with one another. This is when we see characters as good or bad and we're introduced to their main ideas and their main wants of the story. It sets up everything that's going to happen going forward. During the exposition, the character learns uh, their, their main goal and what's at stake. In, in musicals, this is where we get the I want song or the thing that pushes the character onward towards what they're trying to accomplish. In the second part of the pyramid, we have the rising action. So the rising action is basically um, an inciting event or series of events that causes a ripple effect in the world that we're living in. This is when conflict starts, conflict being differences of wants between two characters. The incident that occurs, whatever it may be, essentially tells the main character or the protagonist that they need to step up and take action and make something happen. In many ways, the, the rising action is the, the longest part of the story, if we're talking duration, because it's filled not only with uh, reaching towards our final goal, but it's filled with a bunch of smaller obstacles that the character usually needs to overcome. The top of the pyramid is the climax, which is the, the turning point of the story, basically. The protagonist in the climax makes a big decision that impacts not only the outcome of the story, but also who they are as a person. It's when we get to see their judge of character. In kind of a fairy tale setup, there's usually a protagonist and an antagonist, the villain character, right? And it's during the climax when we see the protagonist and the antagonist kind of develop their own plans to go after one another. This is usually the first time that the audience sees the protagonist and the antagonist in kind of direct contact or conflict with one another. Usually up to this point, we've only seen them kind of existing in their own worlds, but now the worlds are colliding and creating kind of a weird Venn diagram of sorts. <laughs> the Venn diagram of people who take this playwriting class and are successful as playwrights is a circle! <laughs> That's not very funny. The fourth part of the pyramid is the falling action. And this is the part that probably gets the most confusing to people as they first learn about the structure. So the falling action, even though it feels as though it's a, it's a point that is less intense, uh, the falling action is usually how we usually consider stories the, the high point. This is the final battle between Harry Potter and Voldemort. This is the big climactic war that happens in Lord of the Rings. Usually at the start of the falling action, the, the antagonist has the upper hand. This is kind of the point when we see that the hero or the protagonist is at a low, low point that we don't know if they can come back from. By some uh, convenience of the plot or something like that, uh, the, the hero or the protagonist wins. And this is in the fifth part of Freitag's Pyramid, which is the conclusion, or the more fancy word, the denouement. Everything is good, justice is restored, this, that, and the other thing. Probably the more bookish way of putting it is that the conflict has been solved. And to be clear, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the protagonist or the hero always wins in this story. It just means that someone has won. One thing that's really important to remember is that you know, we can look at this kind of structure and we can use it to help build our story, almost kind of like a graphic organizer. But that doesn't necessarily mean that your story or your play needs to follow this structure 
to the T, to the T. This is a good structure that's existed in stories for many, many years, but it doesn't necessarily mean that all stories that follow it also need to follow this same structure. With all that being said, uh, let's go over a couple of something that we call plot devices. Plot devices are essentially common things that you see in plots that help move the story along or help uh, communicate your narrative. One that you might hear a lot is something called a deus ex machina, which also pulls from Latin. That's Latin. Deus ex machina, or God from the machine, is essentially, um, it's a complete convenience of the plot. When we're in the, the falling action and it seems like the protagonist could never win and things could never be good again, something happens, usually out of convenience, to just make sure that the protagonist wins. There's a really famous story called War of the Worlds where this happens, where aliens invade uh, Earth and they take everything over and it seems like they're going to win, and then at the end of the story it turns out, oh no, spoiler alert I guess, the aliens actually can't sustain themselves with earthly bacteria. They, they can't sustain themselves with the earthly bacteria and so they die before the end of the story. Another really funny one um, is called a red herring. So a red herring is basically a villain or an idea that's meant to trick the audience. Um, it's usually used in like whodunits or mystery stories. There's a really great example in uh, uh, an old Scooby-Doo cartoon called A Pup Named Scooby-Doo where there was a character called Red Herring. And Red Herring was kind of like the bully because it's the Scooby-Doo characters as like elementary schoolers. In every single episode of the show, Freddy, Freddy, Fred, Fred, his name is Fred. And in every episode of the show, Fred is convinced that Red Herring is the villain, but it turns out he was a Red Herring the whole time and it was actually someone else. The last one I want to talk about is probably the most advanced and is in reference to a playwright um, and it's this idea called Chekhov's gun. The basic idea behind Chekhov's gun, or kind of the elevator pitch version of it, is that if you show a gun on stage in the first act of your play, then in the second act, it needs to go off. This is just an example, but what it's meant to highlight is that every element of your plot is important. If you introduce something, and it feels important, it should come back and be relevant to the story later in the plot. A really good example of this is actually in The Incredibles. The villain syndrome that we see later in the movie is actually introduced at the start of the movie as the character. I think his name is Buddy? Why'd you do that? But we're introduced to the start of what that character would be at the start of The Incredibles movie. That being said, um, I actually have another writing prompt for you for this week. So make sure you get out your pens and pencils or whatever, or type it out, to uh, learn about what it is. The main idea to take away from everything is that uh, plot is a collection of cause and effect. One event affects another. And so using that idea, here's the writing prompt. Take a famous fairy tale like Rapunzel or Snow White or Cinderella and break it down into its plot points. A happens, which makes B happen, which makes C happen. Break it down into its plot points, and then after you do that, change one of those plot points. Instead of Rapunzel letting down her hair, maybe she lets down a rope. How does her letting down a rope instead of her hair impact the rest of the story? What changes? Thank you for joining me for the Rose's second installment of our digital playwriting class. I'm very excited to keep this project going and connect with you um, while you're at home. I look forward to seeing you next week when we start talking about character. I'll see you then. This isn't even that good.